Hello, my name is Debbie Doyle. I'm the meetings manager here at the American Historical Association. Uh, thank you for attending our webinar on integrating environmental history into the classroom, a roundtable discussion, which is part of the AHA colloquium series of virtual AHA. We're excited to have you join us and are looking forward to a productive discussion. I would like to thank our generous sponsors, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Stanton Foundation, the History Channel, and Oxford University Press. You can support virtual AHA and other AHA activities by joining the association, or if you're already a member, making a donation today. We'll post links with details in the chat at the end of the conversation today. A few logistical things to go over before we start the webinar. By registering for or participating in the AHA's webinars, participants and panelists agree to abide by the AHA's Code of Professional Conduct. Please use the Q&A function to submit questions to the presenters. We hope to address all relevant questions, but since we need to be mindful of the time, we may paraphrase or combine questions. If you'd like to be a part of the conversation on social media, remember to use the virtual AHA hashtag. Finally, a quick reminder that this webinar is being recorded and we'll share the recording on the AHA's YouTube channel sometime after the session. I'll now turn things over to the chair of our session today, Christopher Boyer from the University of Illinois at Chicago. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I want to thank you all for, um, uh, for joining us today. Um, I should also uh, uh, say for the record that uh, I'm now actually the uh, Dean of Arts and Letters at uh, Northern Arizona University. Um, so it's, it's good to be an Arizonan. Um, and uh, I am going to um, lightly do a little bit of uh, um, uh, organization of the panel, asking them questions. And, uh, but the main point of the panel is to, is to have an interaction with you two. So uh, without more ado, uh, I will uh, ask the panelists to briefly introduce themselves to you. Uh, rather than asking them to, uh, to survey their uh, curriculum vitae, uh, we are going to actually talk about their teaching interests and their teaching specializations with maybe a little bit of their publication record in there as well. So uh, let's start with uh, Marshall Wieseker. Marsha Weisiger. Um, Weisiger. I, that's okay. Um, I'm Marsha Weisiger. I am the uh, Julie and Rocky Dixon Chair of U.S. Western History and an Associate Professor of History and Environmental Studies at the University of Oregon. Um, my last monograph was called Dreaming of Sheep in Navajo Country, so I, uh, which deals with um, gender, environment, and uh, Indigenous history. Um, and as a teacher, I uh, teach a lot of upper division courses to undergraduates in environmental history or um, uh, U.S. Western history and also graduate students in environmental history. Um, and most of my um, students are actually environmental studies majors, which presents unique uh, challenges and opportunities. Thank you, Marsha. Um, next up is Darren Spies. First flail. Um, hi, Darren Spies. I am the uh, Assistant Dean of Students and in Interim History Department Chair at Sidwell Friends School in Washington, D.C. Um, my first book was Defending Giants, the Redwood Wars and the Transformation of American Environmental Politics. Um, I've taught at both the undergraduate level and for the past 13 years um, um, at the Sidwell Friends Upper School. And I teach courses in US history and global environmental history, um, modern pop cultural history, um, and then a public history and archives course as well. Thank you. Uh, next is Michelle Berry. Good morning or afternoon, depending, I guess, on where you are. Uh, my name is Michelle Berry. I am uh, at the University of Arizona as a Associate, uh, professor of practice, assistant professor of practice, and I am in the gender and women's studies department, although my background is as a environmental historian with 20th century US West and agricultural research interests. I've taught everything from six to 16 is how I like to say that. Um, not no graduate students for me, uh, but uh, lots and lots of folks in between there or before that. Um, taught for 10 years at an independent school here in Tucson and then returned back to the university about four years ago, where I teach a whole variety of classes, uh, mostly in envi US environmental history and then gender and comparative uh, topics uh, ranging from tech 
nature and society, uh, technology studies, et cetera. And finally, uh, a, a dear colleague of mine uh, from who I knew actually back when she was still a graduate student at the University of Arizona, Emily Wakefield. Thanks, Chris. And thank you all for being here to have this conversation with us today. Um, I am a professor of history and director of environmental studies at Boise State University in Idaho. Um, I researched Latin America. My first work, work, book was about um, Mexico's national parks, and I am on the cusp. So sometime in the next decade, I will finish my second book about um, parks in South America. But I have, like Michelle, I have taught and, and Darren have taught a really wide range of students. Before graduate school, I taught for three years on the US-Mexico border, science and social studies at the sixth grade level with a program called Teach for America. In graduate school, I was lucky enough to teach a whole range of different classes, both as a TA and an independent instructor. I had the privilege of serving as a TA for Michelle back in the day, in fact. Um, and then I taught for five years at an elite um, private small liberal arts college in the South. And then um, teaching small um, boutique, amazingly personal classes with students, and then in a, in a range of topics from Latin America to global environmental. And then I came to Boise State and have also taught a wide range from introductory surveys to um, small topical surveys at the graduate and undergraduate level. Three years ago, I moved over out of history and into environmental studies full time, and that's been an interesting um, intellectual switch and also switch in the type of teaching that I do. So we have a, a suite of five questions uh, that we're going to pose. Uh, what's going to happen is that the, the panelists will discuss these questions. Uh, we have a, a, a rough order in which they will uh, address some of the questions and then um, I will actually keep time so that we are able to uh, get through the questions in, in time uh, to open it up to the participants who are who are now number 43 um, so that they can be a robust uh, back and forth between the panelists and the uh, the audience. So without more ado, um, how can we integrate environmental history more fully into the into the discipline of history or the humanities curriculum generally? And here I'm talking about particularly in a holistic way, um, one that doesn't make environmental issues seem episodic, such as you know, teaching the Columbian Exchange and then moving on, you know, that that environmental moment is is over and we've moved to something else uh, um, or make it uh, or, or it, as in some classes sort of that center around catastrophism, uh, for example, the Dust Bowl. So integrating environmental history into the curriculum. All right, I get to go first on this one. Um, I, I... I was thinking about the, the ways in which I started to integrate environmental history into my US survey course um, kind of evolved out of having my students read um, Thomas Andrews kind of article about the five C's of historical thinking. So context, change over time, contingency, causality, and complexity. And I forcefully told my students that we had to add another one that wasn't a C but that we had to start thinking about nature as a historical force. And like that stayed on the whiteboard in the room that I taught in all year long. Um, and, and so we just kind of repeatedly would ask and weave in questions about ecology and climate and landscapes and bugs into what we were studying. And I had a couple of examples that folks might be interested in. One was around the American Revolution um, having students look a look at um, at some of the at some excerpts from John McNeil's Mosquito Empires to start to think about the role that disease and bugs played in that war, and that also then translated them, you know, a few weeks later when we were talking about the Haitian Revolution to talk about again kind of yellow fever and bugs and the role that mosquitoes played um, 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 in those in those periods of time. Um, we can also do you know, like thinking about the Gulf Coast and the expansion of the Cotton Kingdom and the changes in the landscape that that wrought onto the uh, lower Mississippi River Valley. Um, those have been really useful to just keep coming home and, and actually in surveys at the end of the classes, when I ask students like what they remember most, like half of them will write, nature is a historical force, uh, which I find is a great victory. Um, in my pop culture seminar, one of the units we do is like, um, uh, the history of monsters in film, 
and focusing on kind of modern, you know, the swamp thing and various kinds of environmental monsters um, that appear again as a way to try to like pull those things together. And then I have them write an essay uh, review of Black Panther um, as an environmental historian. And the title of it has to be The Secret Environmental History of Black Panther. And so I think those are some of the ways in which I've worked to kind of weave in environmental history into um, the broader history curriculum. Yeah, I would just, I would add what, what Darren has sort of just modeled, which is, it sounds super obvious, but intentionality. So the way that we integrate the environment into history and other humanities classes is by meaning to do so um, and looking for it. And we, when we create our lesson plans and we create our curriculum, nearly every story we tell has at its core um, some, some part of, of nature, some part of non-human environment, right? So one of the things that I think often US historians and maybe folks who, who do global history as well in other places, we often talk a lot about the automobile, right? And the creation of the automobile and all of the changes that that wrought in terms of the labor that was required, especially in the United States and the Henry Ford factory system, et cetera. Um, the trade, the trade wars that happen around auto automotive making over time. But at the very crux of that are natural resources. It's about fuel, it's about access to metal resources. And if we just continually encourage our students to see the non-human nature that goes into all of these stories, you can think about global trade and centering something like sugar, then all of a sudden, just exactly what Darren just said, the students begin to go, oh, wait a second, this nature is not a backdrop, it's a player. And sometimes it's actually the driver of human actions and human experiences. And it's around nature that we can see power relationships form because of the nature itself, right? We can think about Mark Feige, who's written a great uh, book, uh, The Republic of Nature, talking, and, and one of his best chapters is about cotton and about the power of that cotton plant to really affect cultures and, and social relationships. So if we as educators just go into it thinking, where is the environment in the stories I tell and how can I prioritize and amplify the stories of the non-human, it will happen and the students will eventually just get very used to it. Stick it on the whiteboard as Darren says. So I don't think we mentioned before, but Michelle and I do have a book about teaching environmental history. <laughs> and the premise, the intentionality that Michelle was talking about is one of the principles of design, right? So planning for that integration is a step that you have to take before you get in the classroom, right? Whether you get in the classroom you know, for today or for the entire semester. And we walk through in the chapters of that book, 10 different strategies. But the two that I'll talk, talk quickly about right now are timelines, right? And so thinking about how factoring in the environment and giving nature, right, a place in the story changes the cadence of the time that you cover, right? And so one way of doing that might include the Pleistocene, right? What, how much do you talk about the um, catastrophic decline of large mammals over 100, 100 kilograms? you know, 10,000 years ago. And how does that change what we understand the landscape to look like and how it behaves? That very question is provocative to students, right? You might include clips from Ice Age, the film, right? Which are always, uh, you know, eye-catching, if nothing else, not as, not as interesting as Black Panther, but, you know, a couple minutes <laughs> that get students thinking about what came before, right? And what came before is often a multi-species menagerie of really interesting connections, right? So thinking about those timelines, it applies not just to the really deep past, but it also applies to the cadence of how we understand change, right? So the revolutions, the political change that make it into a civilizational narrative can be countered by energy transitions. And energy transitions is another place where designing for it allows it to have a space in your classroom, right? The automobile example that Michelle talked about, but also thinking about the vast transformation of how people have used energy plucked from underneath the soil in the last 200 years in a, in a, in a way that has transformed not just our climate, but the way people relate to each other. And that doesn't necessarily, it's so big, it doesn't necessarily factor in to say a US survey class. <laughs> right? Where's your data lecture on that? Well, it's probably not a day, 
And so in order to make sure students understand the vastness of that transformation, it needs to be put in ahead of time and to think about those timescales. And in my experience, asking students to, to rework those timelines with you can be a really useful exercise for them too. Well, I would say that what, I mean, I come from a position that states as Mark Fiji's book, um, The Republic of Nature does that all history is environmental history. And so it's always a theme in my course, uh, any course that I have, how the environment influence things is one of the themes that we track through the entire course. Uh, and some of that in uh, like a US history survey, which I also do teach from time to time is um, some of the things other people have said, but to include readings. For example, when um, you get to the uh, 1970s, I talk about the gas crisis and uh, all of those kinds of things. There's a great uh, essay also by Mark Fiji called It's a Gas that I uh, always assign. But uh, there are lots of different places in which you can find good readings that are really accessible for any level where somebody's distilled their book into an article that's not too wonky. I will assign that uh, as one of the readings. Uh, but also whenever you talk about social movements is another opportunity to talk about environmental politics and it's really easy to integrate. So it does, uh, I have to say it's a minor theme in my environmental or in my US history survey class. It's the major theme when I teach US Western history. And currently I'm teaching an undergraduate class in Native American environmental history. And truly all Native American history is environmental history. So it's been really easy to um, tell the whole swath of Native history through the environmental lens and everything else sort of explains how they got to whatever the environmental issue is that's um, part of that story. So uh, it, I encourage people to think about readings as ways of integrating things in that you get a lot of good discussion out of and some meatiness uh, into it uh, in any course you teach. We, we sometimes think talk about, uh, you know, writing across the curriculum uh, or it's, it's nearly impossible for us to conceive of uh, a humanities or social science curriculum that doesn't have, uh, that doesn't, repeatedly return to questions of uh, ethnicity, gender, uh, social justice. And you know, so what I'm hearing here is that uh, the same is generally speaking true for the way that we think about the environment as part of the human experience. Uh, next up is, um, it, I, it just occurred to me that uh, the, all of the panelists in um, before you today are, uh, have at least one foot in uh, interdisciplinary programs. Um, and so it, it kind of raises the question of how environmental history can contribute to the growth of interdisciplinary programs as components of uh, university structures. Um, so for example, you know, there, there are gender women's studies programs, there's area studies, um, uh, there, there's, uh, and, and, and there's environmental studies uh, that are really, that is I think one of the fastest growing area studies programs. Conversely, uh, I think particularly from your perspectives, it would be interesting to hear hear how the work of these area studies programs, um, including, you know, gender women's studies, uh, can contribute to the development of uh, environmental consciousness within the history curriculum and within, uh, within humanities curriculums in general. Thanks, Chris. And this is something I probably think about too much <laughs> in my sort of personal trajectory and also in the ways that higher ed is changing under our feet. Right. And I, three years ago, I, when I was asked to become the director of environmental studies, I jumped into it head first because I found it to be an interesting intellectual a puzzle. Right. What is it that a historian can add to a mostly social science heavy program and how might that be rewarding for our students and also for me as a scholar was sort of the invitation. And, um, and, and for me, I think that the big piece is that students like Chris just alluded to are voting with their feet for interdisciplinary programs, right? And they are voting with the classes they select, they're voting with the degree programs, and they have access to a whole suite of integration materials that most of us didn't have. Right. And because of that, they sort of start out a couple chapters ahead in terms of content and access to to 
not just readings, but materials that inform them one way or another on a series of different topics. And so the matching of different disciplinary lenses is a really powerful tool for them. In terms of what history I think provides and inter environmental history in particular, I wanna talk for a couple seconds about a class that I teach on animals. And this is chapter four <laughs> in the book. Um, but it's a class that I have also taught four times, including finishing up a remote session of it last week. And when Michelle and I wrote the book and set it out for review, we got these amazing comments back from Flannery Burke, who's now disclosed herself. And one of the most important comments she made was, what is it about this animals in history class that's a history class? It sounds like what you've described is an environmental studies class. And that's a question that has never left me. <laughs> and especially now that I teach the class as not animals in history, but animals in time and space, right? And it's not in a history department, it's in an environmental studies department. And this is the, the this semester was the first time that I had that full conversion experience. And what, and even though the student makeup has largely been the same, like Marsha, most of the students in my animals class as a history class were environmental studies students, not history students, right? And so the, the makeup hasn't really changed, but the placement in the, the program, programmatic profile did, and it made me more um, cognizant of what students were getting. And what they were getting is access to the tools for primary source research that they don't get anywhere else and that are crucial, not just for giving the environment and the animals or the climate a voice, right? but for having students understand how to seek veracity and to find points in the past where the truth comes true, come, comes through, right? So even just forcing them to write a paper using newspaper articles before 1950 was enough of a tool <laughs> for environmental studies, study students at the end of the semester to say, you know, that's something I've never done before. And it's incredibly powerful for me to be able to do that. And I think accessing knowledge that happened more than a decade ago <laughs> is an incredibly powerful tool that history has to offer interdisciplinary programs. And I'll let other people say what they think interdisciplinary programs might offer history, <laughs> or we can come back to that in the Q&A. Yeah, great. Um, I would. I would just add, and it goes a little bit to Claire's question, Claire Mayo's question in the in the question and answer um, queue. Uh, uh, Emily just started to talk a little bit about how powerful it can be to use primary sources. They're still written by humans, but they're written about animals, right? And sort of thinking about even about public policy approaches in the past. Some of my own research is around cattle and the power of cows to create entire cultures and an entire edifice of political power in the US West among uh, uh, especially Anglo, but also even American Indian cattle ranchers. So, so absolutely, we, ha we can use uh, primary sources to think about interspecies um, history and to think also about decentering the human and recentering the things uh, beyond the human. I think that one of the things that non-history disciplines maybe do better than history is theory, right? And so, one of the classes I teach is a class that really is centered around the idea of nature. And that requires us to bring in a bunch of historical examples of the ways in which people over time have thought about nature and the ways in which nature itself has exerted itself as a player in history. And we go kind of from colonial US through the 21st century, but we start the class with a theoretical grounding that's outside history. So we start the class by looking at ecofeminism. We start the class by looking at environmental justice theory. And we start the class by looking at queer theory. And by using all three of those theor theories, and of course we, we build on them and learn them better as we go. This is a 200 level, uh, sort of lower level gen ed class. So big stuff, big abstract stuff for students. But as we march through it, they begin to see a dialectic that's emerging. They begin to see sort of the material uh, uh, manifestations of some of those theories and some of the praxis in the structures and the cultures that emerge from theories about what it means to be human what is what is this what is this business of nature? Um, and so there's a bunch of cool stuff out there. Critical animal studies has a lot to offer here. Uh, uh, critical black uh, studies has a lot to offer here. Of course, indigenous studies, traditional ecological knowledge, et cetera. I assign a terrific, very accessible Orion magazine article 
really good for undergraduates about how to queer, how to, uh, what's it called? I always forget the name of this darn thing. It's by Alex Johnson, but how to queer ecology one goose at a time, right? And so that, that even undermines how we think about what we know about what ecology or nature, what is natural and what human beings think we know a lot, especially Western scientific knowledge about how nature works, but we see all kinds of queer things happening that, 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 that this sort of the, the traditional take on nature as ordered gets upset a bit. And so just by playing with those ideas, there's never an answer, which students, students don't always love, uh, but that interspecies and thinking really beyond the human and the non-human binary, that's the kind of stuff that I think we have to get to so that we can stop being anthropocentric, we can center and include the non-human in all of our conversations. And we have to start by thinking about inter and trans species stuff. And I think that's what at least some of the gender women's studies and ethnic studies, et cetera, have to offer. Yeah, the, um, there's, I, I've been recognizing here, there's a why in many ways, Emily and I are like kindred spirits. We, in terms of our fascination with parks, I also in the next decade, we're hoping to finish a, a second book about Rock Creek Park in DC as like an environmental history of DC. But also when Defending Giants was, re, was getting reviewed as a draft, one person said, why is this in the history thing? It should be in environmental studies. And I said, no, and I quickly did a whole bunch of revisions to like try to ice that out. But then when I designed a few years ago, redesigned my global environmental history seminar, I explicitly tried to connect it to a bunch of our area studies and um, social science courses. So I intentionally pulled in some anthropology readings and um, um, into Michelle's point earlier, pulled in um, um, you know, a Judy Berry essay about ecofeminism eco to try to connect it to what some of the students were doing in gender studies and started to pull in way more um, about Africa and the Anthropocene to try to connect it to some of their, the work they were doing in, in, in modern Africa, African history. And I think that's like an important right vehicle for history and interdisciplinary studies too, is to, is to try to like build those bridges for students um, as well. And I'm the annoying the department chair who's always sending out articles to all of the area studies people when they pop out about, you know, what some, some environmental history thing um, that relates to whatever they're doing. Um, but I think that redesigning that global environmental history seminar to like engage with as, an, as a multidisciplinary seminar, um, I think is, it was a, a successful way to try to connect the other courses that they're doing in, this, in these interdisciplinary areas. I'm gonna jump in here to, uh, to keep us uh, moving from, from one topic to another. This was a, a rich discussion and actually I think it, it, it really is it's interesting how there can be sort of boundary keeping um, and where that boundary keeping of this is history, this is not history, this is environmental studies, this is not environmental studies, that the way that that pops up and where it pops up um, is sometimes I think really quite revealing. I didn't get a chance to address that question. So I want to do so um, because I uh, have had uh, a lot of experience experience in teaching environmental studies students history. And uh, I believe strongly that just as in a mathematics class, even though I, those students, most of them will not become mathematicians, they are required to do math, um, I, that uh, environmental studies students should learn how historians work. And so typically, I uh, always have an archival project where they have to go into the archive, look at a curated set of uh, collections on a particular topic. Forestry is one that I've used a lot in the past. The Oregon Trail is another one and where they have to go in and then develop um, a history based on the readings in one collection or as a subset of a collection that makes it reasonable for the students. Uh, during COVID, it is, that has been challenging, as you might expect, and so it required me uh, in this last year to be a bit more imaginative. So one of the exercises I had uh, students do last term in an environmental history class at the 300 level was to first write, uh, they had to go and uh, find three um, articles in High Country News, which offers free subscriptions to students uh, that span a period of 20 years and write an op-ed 
the piece. And then they had to take that same topic and expand that with another primary source, an academic article uh, by a historian, although not everybody understood what that meant. But at any rate, that was supposed to what they were supposed to do. And then create a podcast where they had a podcast script they had to submit first, get some feedback on, and then um, record their podcast. And that was just really fantastic. Um, that was really one of the best projects that uh, they've ever done, and they all seem to get a, a great deal out of it. And then this term, I'm doing something similar, except for that they're having to write a regular eight to 10 page research paper, again, based on newspaper articles, also from uh, uh, Indian Country News, or I can't remember the exact title of that uh, newspaper, but um, and, and then um, similarly, they have to use a set of government sources, um, treaties, things that can be found online uh, to create a research paper. And I'm really anticipating, and what they're doing is writing a policy paper for Deb Holland uh, to implement on public lands. And so we'll see um, what they come up with, but there's lots of ways of integrating history and environmental studies in ways that help to get uh, environmental studies people to understand how historians think. And then I've also, in this class on Native American environmental history, because I do have about half the class being historians uh, this time, they've had to read, for example, in the Pleistocene, the debate in the scientific literature over uh, the overkill hypotheses during the Pleistocene, and then uh, discuss that in class. So that is all worked really well of integrating lots of different things into uh, an interdisciplinary class. So uh, next up is a question of how we can, uh, how can invent, how environmental history, uh, how can we can include practical or experiential learning, for example, local excursions, internships, or virtual experiences into environmental history or environmental humanities class or curriculum? Okay, I'm gonna give a short presentation where I'm gonna share my screen to show how I have developed, we do field trips in um, my environmental uh, history classes typically, although not during COVID, but uh, it's been a challenge at first to figure out field trips that didn't require us to uh, get in cars and go someplace. And so this is what I come up with and I will share my screen and show you briefly how to this is done. Let's see here. Oops. Okay, so uh, one of the research methods that sometimes distinguishes environmental history from most other historical fields is an approach bother, bo bo I can't talk, borrowed from historical and cultural geographers uh, that involves examining the land itself as a primary source. And we call this reading the landscape. And I've long taken my environmental uh, history classes on these field trips to learn the value of reading landscapes. But this could be done in many types of courses, particularly um, area studies courses like regional uh, history courses, urban history, and any environmental uh, studies class can benefit from this. Um, and uh, one of those field trips has been right off campus involving the Eugene Mill Race, and I'll use that as my example. Now, Eugene, like so many Western towns, uh, was once a thriving mill town, as pictured here. here. This is the mill pond at the end of the mill race and all, a variety of different mills that were run. And for those of you who are interested in more information on how to do this kind of thing, I recommend this book by William Wyckoff, How to Read the American West, a field guide that was published in 2014. So just quickly here, I mean, this is the UO campus. So we go across a, a busy street and go over to a duck pond, which looks like a little blue blob here, follow a path along what everybody experiences as being kind of a creek. Uh, perhaps they aren't quite clear on that until this trip. We go over a pedestrian bridge, we follow what's known as the canoe canal for a while and loop back over a pedestrian bridge to uh, the point of beginning. And before the trip, 
uh, I show them a series of maps and uh, photographs to give them a sense of the layout and how things looked historically. And then we bring these maps and some documents into the field, a good pair of binoculars. And then it's always useful to bring someone who knows more about the landscape than you do along with you. So for this trip, I bring a geomorphologist who knows something about the history of flooding on the Willamette River and how the natural environment has been changed by that. So these trips are always interdisciplinary and I've got somebody that I'm confident can answer the questions I don't know the answers to. We began our field trip at this mill pond that is across from campus. And up until this point, students have known this as the duck pond. So they've seen this as a natural feature, the duck pond. And from here, we treat this as a detective uh, work basically. We walk along a, a pedestrian and bike path that students are very familiar with. Um, along the river, we look over and we see this buried pipe uh, that's exposed at this point um, through the vegetation. We see this caution screen and we stop and wonder about that. We see this bunch of concrete out of the middle of nowhere that's just like down from the path between the kind of an elevated path and the river. And then we see this uh, series of uh, piers out in the middle of the river that students have, they've tubed or kayaked along here and wondered like, what the heck is this? So this is something that's very familiar to them. And what we uh, discover, we don't really know the answers to this just by looking, but we look at those maps and an archaeological report. And this reveals that um, the embankment and the concrete slabs and the piers are part of a diversion system that was built after a series of floods in the late 19th century. And then the pipe, uh, the rusty pipe was um, to bring fresh water to the mill race when this became a popular recreational site for the Greek system to do uh, canoe trips down the canal. And the most surprising thing we discover is that this uh, popular running path, which is shown in red here along this map, uh, and it's called the canoe canal, isn't a canoe at all. It's actually a slough created uh, when the river jumped course, basically jumped channels. Uh, so it's a remnant of the braided uh, Willamette River uh, that changed in 1890. So, you know, we show that you reading the landscape raises the questions that, that we can then go and look at the archival sources to find the answers to in sort of an interactive kind of thing. So we learn through all of this, not only that the man-made environment like the duck pond and the mill race that people had assumed were part of the natural landscape uh, are actually man-made and that the thing that they thought was uh, man-made, the canoe canal is natural. So one, this helps us to see all of the different ways that human history and nature are deeply intertwined. And that is of course the key lesson, I think, of environmental history, but also urban and regional history. So I encourage you all uh, to look around your own campuses to see what environmental stories you might be able to tell. I've also done trips that didn't fare so well, but uh, so you have to you know, keep trying them out and tweaking them to make them work, um, but uh, it can be really satisfying. And we do this typically like on a Friday and Saturday, I repeat them, it takes about three hours, which also includes a stop at a picnic table uh, near the end where they reflect on what they've learned and write something down uh, before we leave. So we do it on a Friday and Saturday so that students can uh, fit it into their schedules and then give it uh, as many points as I would give a, a short writing assignment uh, for the class. So anyway, that's what I recommend to y'all. I will unshare my screen. There. So I have a few examples too that echo what um, Marsha pointed out about using the site where your campus is, is sitting. And like Eugene, um, my campus is along a river. What's interesting about the other side of the river is that Boise, Zoo Boise, there's a zoo there. So you can actually see two giraffes 
um, and their heads up above this river that has been dammed and channeled, but is still in other respects natural. And on both sides are um, a paved 25 mile green belt that traverses the city. So I've used that as a, as a field trip as, as Marsha um, has sort of outlined here um, in, in two different ways. The one of them is um, uh, in the animals class, I gave students remote game cameras and asked them to set up a question they wanted the cameras to answer. And this was more the environmental studies side that we pulled it back into history in some important ways. And it was a really interesting exercise in thinking through how you build evidence and how you do what Michelle mentioned before, which is center the non-human in a geography that you're very familiar with. And so what was so exciting about the game camera lab assignment was that students, number one, got a bobcat, right? So there, there is this <laughs> river right next to campus by those giraffes that has a live bobcat going up and down, looking for lunch and all of that. Um, and a, a mink den. So those were the two most exciting finds. But some of the best insights came from the squirrels and the geese and some of the more regular coyote visitors that use those trails as much as humans do. The second place that I have used local excursions and experiences um, is in a class on beavers. And I apologize that lawnmower is going next door <laughs> with somebody else. Can you hear me okay? Is that better? Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so I have had the privilege of teaching an entire capstone seminar on beavers and beaver dam analogs. And the most powerful part of teaching the class entirely on beavers is the hope that it plants in students for restoration and for thinking about the world whole. And in history classes, so much of what we do is teach students to be critical and to um, analyze the ways power has manifested in ways that are harmful. Right? And what is hopeful about a class on beavers is that you can take this furry, amazing animal and think of it as a gift to the future. Right, and think of the ways that this animal can rework a landscape and restore degraded ranch land that has otherwise been decimated, right? And this is not an animal with a happy background, right? Nearly exterminated from almost all of the West and still trapped in the city of Boise, which eliminates between um, 10 and 12 beavers a year, right? But between in reintroducing the animal, the animal coming back in all sorts of landscapes and thinking about the ways engineering has paid attention to beaver dam analogs and the ways of, of rechanneling stream flows, provide students with ways of thinking about land management that talk about restoration and that look at the ways that something that's degraded can be made, if not whole, at least better again. And I think that those are, seeing that happen on the landscape, so our students went and helped the city build a beaver dam analog as part of their class, right, was really powerful for, for bringing those things in. I'll just add one short piece on, on, on to um, what Emily and Marsha described. With, I also like to use our campus um, uh, much smaller than, than Eugene or, or Boise State, but still very useful and tucked in between two kind of tributaries of, of the Potomac and Rock Creek. Um, we ran a pilot for this last year and then had to you know scrap it during COVID, but um, getting students to um, in our archives on campus to investigate the history of the landscape and the history of the campus and using aerial photographs and maps and architect reports and, you know, rifling through old school newspapers to try to piece together some kind of stories about the, the built environments um, um, on our property and on the campus and to see it as a changing, you know, ever developing and evolving um, um, process and landscape. I think has been really cool. And, and next year, when we get to run it for an entire semester, uh, it'll be fun. And the thing that they, I think, like most about it is, is then we'll turn them into um, exhibits for campus for on display as like an official part of, right, the wayside markers or a museum exhibit. So to take kind of what they know about this very familiar, intimate place, and then to be able to kind of show, you know, the rest of the, of, of the proverbial world, I suppose, um, some of their findings and to take that then and, and make it something public, I think 
will be uh, will be exciting if the pilot project last year um, taught at, taught us anything. Yeah, I, I, thank you so much for that. I, I I might just interject as well that it's it is possible to uh, do online experiences for students. Um, we've had some success with uh, uh, helping students to create content, for example, for um, websites, uh, Little Village uh, Environmental Justice Organization in Chicago, for example, um, it has an environmental history component. Um, we've also had some students who will get involved with museums um, and you, you, it's, it, it is possible to have virtual experiences that I think are also uh, experiential uh, and can help uh, students to think of, to learn in new ways and to be doing do independent learning. Um, so particularly, you know, in the last 10, 15 years, uh, questions of um, uh, social justice, um, race, class, gender, um, have begun to permeate the scholarship on environmental history uh, as well. And um, I was wondering if we could talk a little bit about uh, how we could use environmental history to address issues of inclusivity and social justice within the history curriculum, or once again, for those of you who work within a broader uh, interdisciplinary or humanities curriculum, uh, how it might fit within. Well, my answer to that also kind of dovetails with the experiential um, and, and the pedagogy that I use called project or, and or problem-based learning. Um, and I think what's, what's powerful Powerful about environmental history is that if there's anything that we all have in common, that everyone in the, hum in the human, in homo sapiens across the world have in common, is our dependence on the non-human world. Uh, we're not going to make it if we have profoundly unhealthy ecosystems, if we have non-functioning biomes, if our biodiversity disappears, we're in huge trouble. Uh, when our forests get knocked down and, and, and all of this stuff occurs, as we all know, that's going to affect everyone and it's going to affect them differentially. So asking students to think about public policy decisions that get made with a certain cultural worldview in mind that decimate ecosystems and then the ramifications of that decimation, um, it can be really, really powerful. So in Tucson, a local example is water, right? And so especially when I taught um, in the high school level, we had a thing called project inquiry and it was an interdisciplinary uh, project-based learning experience for students that ask them not just to investigate some of the social justice, uh, social injustice and environmental injustice that has happened due to the water use in this very arid place, but it also asks them to problem solve. And I think I'm very passionate about a couple of things. One, to not only think about environmental injustice as affecting humans, but about environmental injustice affecting the environment, right? So when we talk about inclusivity, it should be people from marginalized community and 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 people and beings from marginalized communities beyond the human right so and 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 the bigger more expansive we can get the better the more inclusive we can be in, th in our thinking the better our solutions to our really big problems will be if you take those big problems and sort of localize them in a way that Darren and Emily and Marsha are talking about students begin to go, okay, these problems might be solvable, right? Think it's the old, you know, the old adage, think local and, and it'll become global or whatever that is. Um, and so for us in, in Tucson, it's really about water and it's about groundwater and it's about surface water. Rivers used to flow around here and they don't anymore. And in the last year, because of the mega drought that we're in, they don't even flow during monsoons or during the winter runoffs because the water's just sinking in the water table so low that the runoff is just sinking into the, the ground immediately. So asking students to imagine a Sonoran desert where there were once rivers, to imagine what it looked like when white colonists came in, Spanish colonists and, and others, American colonists came in and sort of began to utilize water for uh, unsustainable practices like cotton farming, et cetera. Asking them to look at that change over time uh, is really powerful. And then saying to them, okay, great. Now we've critiqued the, the heck out of where we are. How do we build something else? What's the new public policy gonna have to look like? How do we get folks on board? And if you can ask an essential question, right? right how can we ensure the, the, the safety of water for all beings in the Tucson basin from, for the next 100, 200 years? And, and have students, 
organizations create, whatever it is, whether exactly what Chris is saying, a website that, that goes to a public audience, as Darren is saying, get community partners involved like Tucson Water, which we were able to do, et cetera. Students begin to see the usefulness of understanding history. They begin to understand, they begin to have some empathy taking happen because they go, oh, wait a second. The Tohono O'odham and other indigenous peoples in this valley got screwed over in this process. How and why and how do we fix that? And then what happens to the Sonoran Desert itself when the water table drops to such an extent that the desert itself dies and we begin to have very intense problems with the, with the heat as it connects to climate change. And believe it or not, if the class sort of takes that project-based perspective and the whole class is around that project, you'd be amazed at all of the ways in which all the things that you can get students to think about transdisciplinary, public policy, applied history. I've realized over the years, I'm, a, I'm an applied historian. I didn't realize that back in the day. I like history for, for history's sake, because I'm a nerd. But I also really think for most of our students, especially in the lower division classes, or the non-majors, this is about arming them with tools to go in the world and make a big difference. And so I think that that is um, sort of where we can have environmental history be project-based, maybe be local, be problem-solving, um, and always contributing to social justice because you can't do a good job solving the problems by having a narrow view of the problem itself. That's pretty exciting, Michelle. Um, I, um, I, I wanted to share just a couple of minutes about thinking about um, inclusivity and social justice kind of in, in the classroom itself and the ways in which I've tried to design my global environmental history course to accomplish it. And I, I, I think about it and, or have grown over the past several years to be thinking about it in terms of the numbers of kind of windows and mirrors that I offer students into right seeing themselves and what we study, but also windows into seeing people that are not them. And I think that's been super powerful. And I, it, a, a huge shout out if you haven't ever been there, folks in the audience, but the the syllabus project um, on Zotero is a super amazing resource for kind of helping to do this and to think through. And the way it starts, which I started to think about in terms of connecting, right, like, like Michelle said, the one thing that all humans have in common is, is their, right, our, our various, but all relationships with kind of non-human world. And to be thinking about what are the ways in which I can shift students' gazes around the globe at different points in time during the semester. Um, and so, right, when we're looking at the Colombian exchange, what happens if we then shift our gaze in the same time period to West Africa and red rice, red rice agriculture and the technologies that they develop there? And what does that do? It both gives them, right, it, it, it kind of decenters them, but it also then, I think this is a powerful, possible powerful tool in terms of inclusion and social justice for environmental history is that it, it helps to create a different, right, a new narrative than for the Atlantic slave trade as well, right? Here are, here are these folks in West Africa who developed these technologies and developed these crops that then were, you know, used and stolen without giving credit to by South Carolinians. And so being able to kind of change that narrative or what happens when we're talking about about you know forest conservation and we shift our gaze to the Chipko movement in the you know in, in in southern India and tigers and what does that do in terms of right understanding the relationships between American environmentalism and the rest of the world and the ways that it was built off of right you know tree huggers and in southern India and the female kind of led movement over there and right and so there's these different ways in which and when we look at the Anthropocene and, and Gabriella Hex, you know, Africa and the Anthropocene article, right? What happens when we shift our gaze right elsewhere outside of the, the center of the Atlantic world for those of us who right, are teaching in the United States? And how can that kind of help to construct new narratives and offer students mirrors and windows where they can see themselves and their families, but also see other people's kind of families and communities in it as well? And I think environmental history, it can be a really powerful tool um, um, in helping folks do that. I love this idea of holding up mirrors for students and using that. So thank you for that, Darren. That's really interesting. I want to 
um, beat the same horse and say animals, I think is the, is the, the perfect way for addressing issues of inclusivity. One of the wonderful things about teaching class entirely on animals is it's actually about people. Right? The animals don't get to speak. They don't get to talk. They're not part of it. What's centered in that class is our relationship with animals and how that changes according to geography and according to time, and according to, to culture, right? And how it also doesn't. And so uh, one of the most powerful things a student said to me this semester was when we were talking about the images they got on their game camera labs and what they found out about the other species that are inhabiting our campus alongside them that they didn't know they were there, it was, I asked them what they should do with that information. Do they need to share it, right? Is that something that they should tell other students about? Should there be a social media campaign? You know, like what do we do with that information? And their consensus was we need more information and better research because if we told people that there were bobcats, there would be a riot, <laughs> right? There would be people that took out their bows and tried to go find it. There, there would be a crisis for those animals, right? There wouldn't be a solution. And so their response was, well, what we need is more information, which I think is the absolute <laughs> educated, most wonderful response for a set of students in a state where social justice in higher education has literally just been outlawed. They pulled $1.5 million from our budget specifically to not be able to teach it, right? And so if we can't teach about social justice across races and ethnicities, how about we do it across species lines? And we watch the big bad wolf for its racial for the 1930s because it's all there and the students get it, right? And we, we think about the persecution of the wolf as a metaphor for the different ways people have persecuted each other, right? And students love to talk about animals, right? Animals are disarming and it allows them to, to, to become disembodied, frankly, and to not identify with either side. And I think that is also one of the paths forward. Right? And, and, and by giving people a way out right, of this, I think we can think about a, a more powerful future. By the way, just to be clear, Emily, I did not come up with the mirrors and windows things. Um, uh, <laughs> Rudine Sims Bishop was like critical in developing that. I got it from our... Uh, Equity, Justice, and Community Director, and have been grateful ever since for her kind of introducing the concept to me because it's it's been a really cool way of thinking about developing syllabi. Well, it's brilliant because it's the same thing as an animal trail or a path, right? It's not accusatory because everybody has windows and mirrors. So, so yeah, that's really great. Well, thank you so much. Um, you know, I, I, this has been a, a terrifically rich conversation, um, but I'd like to open it up to um, our audience and, and our, our listeners. Um, uh, and maybe I would start by, uh, by repeating the question from Claire Mayo uh, about uh, how, instructor, how can instructors approach environmental history as an interspecies history? Now, maybe uh, we've already sort of done this, um, but one of the questions, I think it's really important to, to ask, do you include primary sources from other disciplines um, to move beyond this anthropogenic na narrative? I mean, I think primary sources is, is hard to answer because typically we think of, of, of those as being human derived, I think. Um, but focusing on using primary sources that are primarily about the non-human um, uh, is, is really interesting to think about. So in my own work on cattle ranchers, there was a whole, a whole, I don't know, enthusiastic effort in the 1950s to seed the clouds to bring the rains um, in really the last mega drought uh, that hit, that hit the, the Southwest uh, in the 1953 to 55 were, were there now, but, um, and so it, it was kind of, it's kind of interesting to just like give primary sources that were uh, created letters from ranchers who were in favor of this, uh, uh, ag bulletins, right, that, that were promoting this amazing new technology. And then a few off voices in the ranching community that were sort of like, 
wait a minute, why are we doing this? This there's nothing good that can come from this. We don't know what we're doing. This isn't going to work. It's going to hurt. It's going to, I mean, it wasn't the term then microclimate, but they were basically talking about all the shifts that would occur as a result of shifting microclimates with this kind of um, uh, scientific approach. And so it's, it's a great question about primary sources um, from other disciplines. Indeed, there's all kinds of cool things out there, but they are somewhat human authored. I don't know if other people have thoughts about that, but, but just even just thinking about trying to keep uh, the non-human centered in the sources you use is really cool. And then of course, there's a ton of trans and other. I, in the, in the animals class, so I have some specific examples. Um, we start the first day of class is what is an animal? And I give them definitions. So they read the Bible, they read a definition from Idaho fish and game, right? They, they read the, the army's policy on a support animals. <laughs> they read PETA's website and, you know, a whole slew of other things. And they also read a scientific article from 1959. Why are there so many kinds of animals, right? And so I do try and arm them. And all of those could be history, primary sources, but all of them could also be sort of what Claire's question was, what are they outside of it? And so we use those definitions as a way of building our own definition of what is a non-human animal, and then kind of use that to, to walk forward into the sets of the literature. I think one of the powerful things of including non-human actors in the historical past is to think about the different ways people have listened in the past to those things, right? So it's not just how different disciplines talk about them today, but it's the ways that people were listening and trying to understand them, you know, in, in the 19th century, in the 15th century, and, and well before that. And some of that brings us all the way to paleoecology, right? There's some super exciting scientific research that's coming out right now saying that the po population collapse in Amazonia was not in the 16th century, it was in the 9th century. Right? And that's based on lake deposits and soil samples. And that's transformational, right? Because that means that Amazonia was connected with Cahokia and it was connected with the Mayans in ways that, that historical documents don't allow us to excavate. One of the things I've been using because I'm teaching a Native American environmental history class is um, traditional stories that uh, emphasize um, animals as kin to Native people and just getting students to understand. I mean, I push back against the stereotype of the ecological Indian on the one hand. So it's a delicate dance, I would say, but, um, but they become, come to understand that there are other ways of thinking about relationships with animals than the way we typically in Western societies do, and that that is really what underpins so much of uh, what we see as Native American stewardship of land has to do with this sense of relationships uh, that we seem to have excised in many ways in our own culture and see that as perhaps a model of moving forward, of, of thinking about those relationships in new ways. So, uh, and there, uh, it takes some rethinking about things to sort of fully understand uh, those stories so that you can present them and be the mediator uh, with those stories. But it, there's lots and lots of these published stories uh, out there in museum exhibits with images and all kinds of things that you can use to uh, try to get that across to students. And I think they really appreciate that and, under and really take to it. Uh, in part, maybe because their own pet relationships with animals help them to understand how you might feel a relationship in a way that they hadn't really thought about before. I have to just add that years ago, Marsha came to my high school classroom. I don't know if she remembers this at St. Gregory College Prep through the Western History Association and did an amazing workshop on primary sources that centered, that allowed students to really get at sort of the, the, the beyond the human. Um, and I think Robin Kimmerer's stuff and traditional ecological knowledge, if, you, if you've not done braiding sweetgrass, all everybody, it's a phenomenal text to assign undergraduates and high school students because it's accessible. It's not the ecological Indian because she's a she's a she's a biologist, right? Biologist, ecologist. So yeah, like, he's yeah. A, a botanist or ecologist. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, so that so that kind of text really 
uh, is really, really powerful, I think, you know. Yeah, I have to say I've assigned in this particular uh, term, uh, maybe four different chapters of that and it's a, our library has it as an ebook so it's been free for them to read. And then I had a different set of chapters that I uh, introduced last term in a different class I try not to have too much overlap in case I have overlapping students, but I didn't remember that Michelle that that was your class, that was the greatest time and they are the smartest kids. Uh, but um, yeah, I was surprised. I mean, when I wrote Dreaming of Sheep in Navajo Country, I didn't think of it as a book about animals, even though it's about sheep. Uh, it really hadn't, I had, didn't think about that until people doing animal studies classes and food studies classes contacted me for primary sources to help teach that. So there's lots of ways in which uh, history is, um, is about animals if you just think about it in uh, animal terms instead of human terms. Uh, we have another question from uh, Parsanan Pathasaranthi. Um, to what extent do all of you teach how we have ended up in our current predicament with the environment in non-environmental history courses? It's a great question. What so, did you do this, Michelle? I did this. Nose goes. <laughs> <laughs> I can kind of quickly start with what I hope we'll do this year. One of the things so in my US history survey course this spring, I experimented with given that it's the pandemic um, was um, uh, uh, doing the second half of the survey in reverse chronological order um, and having them start the semester with, or the quarter um, with a survey about what were their most pressing kind of interests uh, or pre most pressing concerns about the world right now and what are their kind of top three interests. And then I had them interview their parents and see if their parents could remember when they were in high school, what were their top three kind of concerns and top three interests. And, and, um, and, and in both cases, right, global warming, besides the pandemic, global warming was the, number, was the number one kind of concern of this group of students. And for their parents in their kind of top five was pollution. And so I'm designing the last, three and a half weeks of the semester to try to, we've been doing things around the, on pandemics and, and globalization, which were other concerns, but then we're gonna to try to just do, tell this story for three and a half weeks of why is it that your parents were concerned about pollution in the like 1980s and you're concerned about global warming now and kind of how do we get here? Um, and I will kind of rely back on um, some of the work that I do in my environmental history seminar with, you know, with McNeil, something new under the sun and, Gabrielle Hex, uh, Africa and the Af Af the Africa in the Anthropocene, um, and we'll kind of just tell it. So I, I think it's like getting student input on this stuff is a great way to kind of figure out how to how to, what are they interested in talking about um, towards the ends of a survey course um, unrelated to environmental history um, that can get you there and get some enthusiasm. I love that idea of surveying people and surveying the students and asking them those questions. One of the, the novelties of Zoom has been pop-up polls and I've used that a lot, but I, I like the thought of longer term planning to use that to drive the curriculum and, and some of the focus. I would My answer to that would be that all history does that and that's the point, <laughs> right? That it helps us understand how we arrived here. So even if it's a class about, you know, the, the pre-Columbian past or the Neolithic age that I think those all help us understand that because those transitions, when you mark them for students on a larger timeline, they see possibility for those future transitions, right? So they help us understand how we got here, how those cumulative small decisions and also those big transitions like the energy transition, right? Like the revolution in human rights and all those pieces sort of add up to that. So I think environmental history is, like other history in that way, I don't think it is exceptional, except like how we've said, it allows for non-human actors to stand in as agents of history as well and to see the, the ways that that's played out. When I, when I taught more of the US survey, I admit that capitalism became the, the, the one villain in the stories that I told. <laughs> So I tended to do thematic teaching for the survey, 
and I had four themes, um, one of them being the environment, but the others being gender, uh, labor and the economy, and then sort of uh, military race and then environment, I guess, number four. And what sort of held the th thread, whether I intended it or not, what came out for students almost every single semester or year was that the thread was that consumer capitalism sort of leads to these decisions that Emily's talking about. Tom McCarthy's book on Automania is really a great book to sort of show the ways in which, you know, Henry Ford sort of started out a bit, a bit of a conservationist. And then there are all these weird decisions that get made about how we go from using ethanol and alcohol as a fuel to using fossil fuels and, and gas and oil. And it, it's a fascinating story to be told of decisions being made with a profit motive in mind, but also to meet consumer demand and sort of that interesting dialectic that happens in a bunch of different settings. And I didn't mean it necessarily to be the thread, but it always ended up being the thread. So I guess if we, if I ever answered the question of how did we get here, it was often based on sort of, you know, unregulated or underregulated consumer capitalism run amok and, and the ways in which that gets understood to be patriotic, understood to be uh, one's duty, uh, one's one's claim to success is to buy stuff and, and have material goods. And that has very real ramifications on the on the non-human environment, including pollution back in the day and climate change now, right? So one thing I did uh, last year, I had to teach um, asynchronously the US history survey. And I hadn't taught the survey for a long time, but I had planned to do this when, if I, we had met in person. Uh, so I went ahead and did it where, um, and they had pre-recorded uh, lectures that they uh, listened to that were PowerPoint slide presentations. But I began each one with a video of me talking about a news article within the last few weeks or months that linked to something in one of my lectures because I wanted to uh, really get across to students that the reason we understand history or need to understand history is it's linked to things that are going on in the world today and it gives them context or what have you. And so I could see um, being able to, in terms of talking about uh, the Anthropocene and uh, climate change, particularly in the weeks that I talked about, um, you know, the gas crisis and all of that kind of thing, that uh, was an opportunity. I can't remember the exact articles that I picked, but I would go on and invariably there was something related. And so you could actually do that through an entire term of bringing in an environmental issue that somehow links to whatever you're talking about, given that I do believe that all human history is environmental history. You could do that and bring uh, that to that with uh, current events. And it seemed to uh, make the students much more engaged with the class than I would have expected, given that it was asynchronous. I also, I also want to make a pitch. I think it's a, it's a really important question. Um, but as many of us, I suspect, have experienced, uh, teaching environmental history can also lead to a sense of, um, uh, it can lead to a sort of a pedagogy of powerlessness, if we're not careful. Um, that the, the, the great acceleration since World War II, uh, the Anthropocene, uh, the sixth extinction, these are huge and, and really disastrous things that are happening in the world. And if we're not careful, uh, I think we can actually leave our students with a sense of essentially climate grief um, that none of us wants. Um, and so one of the things that, that, that I have tried to do is to also give, you know, with in a responsible way and, and, and not in a misleading way, um, examples of things that have worked. Uh, and these tend to be local. Um, they are sometimes indigenous, um, but uh, uh, examples of, of people who have grappled with a problem that they see in front of them, how did they recognize it? How did they address it? And you know, it's, it's almost always imperfect, but, but as a way of saying, look, um, human agency does matter. Uh, many small actions can become uh, a, a structure. Um, so, so that's another thing that, I, that um, I've tried to do in my work, for example, on forestry. Um, I'd like to read you all a question from Bradley Smith. Um, we've touched on many different, uh, on, on different content and events that educators could integrate into their curriculum. However, not all instructors can integrate everything into a non-environmental course all at once. 
do you have ideas for one or two environmental shifts, themes, elements that a new educator could start to integrate into their class? Two quick ones. So if you teach nothing else in the non-human world, teach energy, right? It is the most powerful. And you have a couple examples of how to do that with automobiles, how to do that sort of with timelines, but it is the thing students think least about that has most powerfully transformed the last three generations, right? And so thinking about how my grandmother, right, didn't have electricity, but how, you know, all of the students in your class have known it is a fundamental transformation. So putting energy, putting an example or a module or a lecture of energy anywhere is, I think, the most important intervention you could make for the climate, for teaching environmental history, and really sort of giving your, your students the tools of curiosity to think about those changes that perhaps they haven't considered. And then the simple one is every time you show an image, ask where nature is. Right? Ask them to identify nature in there, just like you might do with race or gender or anything else, but ask what nature's doing. And the students will see it. And they'll see it in ways that, that, that will surprise you. It doesn't require you to do a new lecture, a new unit. It just requires you to ask them the question. And I think if you do that consistently, you'll start to see um, some really interesting insights. Uh, one thing I would suggest is um, that, first of all, there's a whole body of literature that has emerged, and Lisa Brady has been at the forefront of this, of showing uh, the environmental history of war. And so to the extent that you're, all of us, even though we don't uh, necessarily teach military history per se, we teach about wars and how they've impacted things. And so I think that always offers an opportunity to talk about what is it, because almost all of them are based ultimately on e natural resources, or it could be as uh, when we look at the Civil War, there's a uh, a whole body of literature on how the terrain affected uh, military battles. Those kinds of things can be incorporated. And then in every class I teach, no matter what uh, course, I always have something about um, atomic testing, atomic bomb, uh, something like that. And I will say that um, it is the one in fact, I'm planning on creating a course on the comic world uh, because it is the one lecture that I give and it's different in every course um, where you could hear a pin drop. The students are really engaged. They haven't usually gotten that anywhere else. And it is what uh, many people think is the marker for the Anthropocene in terms of geological time. So I think it's a, a moment that you can teach, even though it's catastrophic history, uh, but it's still something that they need to know about and uh, makes it very environmental. And there's a wealth of very accessible literature on this uh, to help you. The only thing I'd add to is one other, you'd always pick a disease and study disease right, and get students thinking about, right, disease as organisms and inhabiting ecosystems and the ways, right, and so, and that, those are very easy things to just plop in anyway, you know, from any time period, there's always disease to talk about. And I would add food. Students get it. It's around everywhere. It affects everything. Uh, if you're, I think you're maybe, are you a US? I don't know what history you teach. Um, this person asking this question. I'm sorry, I forgot who it was, Bradley. Um, but if you're teaching US, I mean, so much of, so much of what has happened economically um, and socially has centered around agriculture in this country, e even, even past World War II, even though we wanna pretend like we became a post-agricultural country post-World War II, we did not. Um, and so that's kind of cool too. If you can just find, you know, find, find a, find a, a piece of food that they, that every student can relate to and, tr and just have it pop in everywhere, you, every, every, whatever topic that you teach. So take a tomato, what's going on with the tomato? Where's it at now? And just quick, it doesn't have to be long and it doesn't have to be like this big lesson plan that gets assessed and all this stuff, just throw it in. Um, and, and maybe even have them choose their own piece of food that they love the most and see if they can continue to figure out where that food appears in the historical narrative that you're talking about for any particular moment. I think we can sneak in a couple more questions. Um, by the way, for a great food is banana uh, because it, it deals with US, US imperialism. It deals with transference of, anyway. So uh, just uh, two, two plugs for the banana right there. Uh, 
the, another question from, from Claire, and then hopefully we'll get to, to one more, um, is you know, how is it that, that the, how do you address the fundamental question of what is nature, rather than the model of nature out there, the human and the nature and that dyad that is, you know, strictly really the part of the Western world in particular. Um, uh, how, you know, how do you deal with the questions of the sense of wild and particularly show that nature is the, is, uh, is immediate non-human environment in which we, we uh, subsist as humans? We're silent because that's the $64,000 question. Yeah, I'd say it's a hard issue, but I'm, I'm gonna note it may be uh, that I have a unusual group of students in that half of them are environmental studies students, but uh, without even talking about that dichotomy and um, humans as part of nature, students have brought that up in their essay uh, about various readings. So uh, it's just kind of having to tease that out. Um, but I, I don't know, I have to say, I don't really address that uh, issue head on in my classes. So what? I'll look to see what others say. I zoned out. I'm sorry, Chris, what was the, what was the question? Uh, so it was basically, how, how do we break down the, the human nature dyad? And I'll actually make one, one example of that. Um, one way that, that uh, um, I, I have in my own classes taught about this is by making use of uh, Cronin's changes in the land, in, in which one of the things that he presents is that, the, the, is that we live within a landscape, right? And we might think of the landscape as sort of given and, and unchanging, but uh, he, among other things, he shows that the, the landscape that U.S. That, that European colonists discovered when they arrived to North America was actually one that had been uh, changed intentionally by, uh, at least in some ways, by Native American people for their own their own uses. For example, creating uh, uh, um, creating clear delineations between forest and grasslands because uh, deer like to browse along those that that change. So things that look like they might have been natural were in fact not natural and people have to learn to live within nature. Um, that's that is certainly one way that, that you can begin to think about. I, I talk a lot about the land actually when I teach um, dirt. Um, the, 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 and, 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 and also point out um, that the environment, of course, is not simply mountains and trees. The urban environment is an environment, and we live within it. And we, and it actually is. We, we are much better at decoding it. Uh, many people, more people, are better at decoding the urban environment these days um, than than used to be better at decoding rural environments um, and living environments. Yeah, the way that I try to do it is um, we will combine. We'll read a little of the you know Cronin's Trouble with Wilderness and Guha's third world critique of radical American environmentalism and an Annie Dillard essay titled The Weasel. Um, and, um, it will, will, and, and so that we will talk about those. And one of the, this, uh, this will go back to kind of just Emily's class on beaver. But the, the question then that I asked them at the end of all of that is, what's the difference between like the Hoover Dam and a beaver dam? Um, and, and so then we start to try to wrestle with Cronin and Guha and Dillard and trying to think through like you know, a little bit of those and, and, and the boundaries and the artificial boundaries. Um, um, it, but it's a, right, it's just something you gotta, I think, kind of just struggle through and ask lots of questions because there's way more questions than there are answers to, aside from the simple answer, which is, you know, humans and nature are all a part of the same thing. But then, right, the, the the consequences of, of that are interesting to wrestle with. Since half of you are in the West, we'll use that term, wrestle. That's good. I hadn't used it yet today, Darren. So thanks for thanks for that. Um, we, you know, I, I think that um, just to reiterate Darren's point, which is to always ask students what they think. Um, and that's incredibly powerful. And so to sort of just walk them through what may seem like a super simple exercise of, of definition, right? Definition making. What do we think nature is? What do we think humans are? What is human nature, right? And just walk them through some of those kind of philosophical questions. And you gotta spend the whole class period because it's gonna be big and it's gonna be wild, but it's wild. Um, but it's like super 
it will be incredibly generative. And if nothing else, it gets them thinking, but there are no answers to that question. So they just gets them thinking and you'll be amazed at the light bulbs that sort of go on and, and the complications that they see emerge and they're just their own discussion and the whole process of trying to make sense of it. Cause I don't know about you all, but most of my students, all of them that I've taught in over 20 years, I don't think maybe, maybe 2% of them have ever thought about that ever. So just approaching that question and asking them what they think and asking them to engage with, with the binary and to think about what does this mean and what are the consequences of the way that we're thinking about this? It's powerful for them. So Darren, I love that. I love pairing it with readings and then getting there. Sometimes you can even ask them those questions, then do readings, then ask them how their ideas changed through the process of reading and study. That's powerful. So just ask them what they think and then go from there. I love that. I think that's super powerful too. One thing that I've asked students to do is to identify what environment they are from. And the majority of them will say the suburbs, right? <laughs> Which is super interesting. And we talk about what that means and how that's an environment and how it's not. And I think that embracing of the hybridity in the middle is a place that they can get to as well. I'm gonna jump in with one last question that I think would actually round out this, uh, the panel really well. Um, and I will uh, once again thank you all for for your your um, your participation here. But we can maybe squeeze in one question, which was from Daniel Webb: How does the history of environmentalism as a social and political movement in the 20th century fit into your curriculum? Well, that's an easy one for me, I guess. And that uh, in this the history U.S. history survey, a big um, emphasis is on social movements. And so an environmental movement is a social movement both in the progressive era. I talk about that as an example of uh, the progressives. Um, I talk about it as um, a part of sort of the 1960s, 70s uh, social movements. Uh, even the civil rights movement, uh, it can be a part of talking about that. Uh, talking about environmental justice issues, those kinds of things. And then in um, similarly, you know, uh, I would say that my, I teach a two-part environmental history class. And the second part is really about the rise of environmental politics in the 1900s or in, you know, in the 20th century uh, to the present. And, um, but I guess my real advice is to think about the places where there are moments in which there is a change in environmental politics, a new, you know, an emergence of something, Ronald Reagan, talking about Ronald Reagan, that brings up another opportunity for talking about the sagebrush rebellion or what have you, or the pushback against environmentalism. So there's many points at talking about political history in which you can assert what's going on in the environmental movement. This may be her heretical, but in, given that I write about the environmental movement, but I have utterly like deprioritized it in my US survey. I have, I have much more heavily kind of emphasized and pushed on kind of them seeing nature as a historical force kind of go to circle all the way back. Um, and I have much more elevated the many of the other kind of social movements of the 1960s um, 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 and then the, where kind of the environmental movement comes in is, is the part of a, a, because we can't cover in any great detail, right? There are so many different rights movements of the 1960s and 70s. They have a choose your own adventure kind of piece of the puzzle and right, the environmental movement, conservatism, gender, right? Immigrant, there's a whole bunch of them. And so students can then select on their own to go learn more about that for their choose your own adventure kind of project about the rights revolution. But I have kind of just calved it off uh, uh, um, for, you know, I, I may come to regret that in the future, but I think it's the right call right now for my current students and the current curriculum, given where we are and who they are. Interesting, as, an, as a non-US historian, I don't typically teach it either, right? In its US incarnation and the way it's sort of part of that, the 20th century story. But I do teach environmentalism in two ways that I think are important. One is in global environmental history. We spend a lot of time in the first days of class differentiating between environmentalism and environmental history, right? And I think that that's a really cloudy place where some students get trapped. 
and we try and give, I give them some of the tools and we talk through the declension narratives and progressive narratives and environmentalism as sort of different pieces of understanding the environment that come in at different points. And then in my environmental studies methods class, I teach the legislation that comes out of environmentalism. So we te I teach the 1970s, we teach, we, we read NEPA documents, we read the Endangered Species Act, and then I take them to the present and we apply that to ones that are happening right now in our area, right? And so the history comes in as part of the backdrop for why these processes work the way they are. And then the, the assessment is for them to redesign a public comment period for a NEPA process that's underway in our environment. Yeah, I just would add, I don't teach Sierra Club anymore. I don't do the big sort of, you know, the big march towards the big institutionalization of, of green. I think about local local activists who do, who sort of promote really powerful changes in their local communities. Rose Agustin in Tucson, for example, thinking about polluted groundwater, for example. So we'll just do a few case studies around that, thinking about environmentalism is, if nothing else, a grassroots movement by people who care about uh, their surroundings, their own, their own health, but also the health of, of others. Terrific. Well, I, I think we've um, we've reached our the uh, the end of the the session. Um, and I don't know if um, ah, we do have a message from our sponsors. <laughs> well, I'd um, like to go ahead. No, I was actually just going to put in a plug for the AHA. Um, <laughs> it, it's particularly important, really, these days. Um, I know that that we uh, may not have the conferences that we once did the live conferences, but um, the AHA continues to advocate on behalf of history and historians. Um, it is, uh, it re really is, I've come to see a, an important organization uh, that, that provides all kinds of advocacy that, that we are maybe not always aware of, although I recommend you look at the website. Um, so <laughs> with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Debbie. Thank you. And I'll also put in a plug for our upcoming annual meeting, which we are hoping will be face to face in New Orleans in January 2022. If things keep going as planned. Um, and also, I'd like to thank our panelists today and our generous sponsors, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Stanton Foundation, the History Channel and Oxford University Press. Thanks to everyone who joined us today and have a great afternoon. Thank you.